We're doing a series on being dedicated to the presence of God. And Noah was a man who was truly dedicated to having the presence of God in his life and living in the presence of his Savior. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 7, which is known as the Hall of Faith. Hebrews 11 and verse 7, it says of Noah, it says, By faith, Noah, by faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. By faith. And he truly was a man who was filled with faith and with courage. Micah, uh, Noah, it says, was a righteous man. Righteous and blameless in his day. And then it says, and he walked with God. Oh, isn't that a great phrase? And he walked with God. <clears throat> I read a story this past week about a guy called Dennis. He was in a place called Katy in Texas. I, mean, I don't know. I don't know how they can name a place Katy, but that's what it's called apparently. And uh, he was in Katy, Texas, and he was going on a trip, and he needed some dry cleaning done. He needed his suit to be dry cleaned. And he remembered this one-hour dry cleaning place on the other side of town. And so he, he got in his car, he hadn't got a lot of time, so he, he, he went across, right across to the other side of town and found this one-hour dry cleaning place. And he went in and he took his suit in, you know, and he took it in and he filled in the form and everything. They, they gave him the slip back and said, oh, I need this back in, in one hour. And uh, the guy said, well, no, I can't do that. You can have it by Thursday. He says, it's Thursday? He says, the sign outside says, one-hour dry cleaning. He says, oh, that's just the name of the store. You know, but Noah was a man who honored his name. He was a man who lived up to his name. It wasn't just something that God said about. He lived a righteous life. He lived a life that was blameless in his generation, blameless in the people of his time. In fact, if you're like the King James Version of the Bible, it says he was perfect. There's four people in the Bible it says are perfect, and Noah was one of them, perfect in his time. Noah walked with God in faith and in courage, while living in a world that wanted nothing to do with God. In fact, they were quite opposed to the things of God. And in the same way, we need faith and courage if we are going to live our lives in this world that is going through a, its own flood of unrighteousness. And if we are going to live our, the kind of life that God wants us to live, it is going to take great faith and it is going to take great courage. So we're going to look at four things about Noah. And the first one is his relationship. Verse 9 says he walked with God. I love that phrase. He walked, doesn't say that of many people in the Bible, only three or four people in the Bible. One of them was a man by the name of, uh, do you know who it was? Enoch. Enoch walked with God. Enoch was a man who was, was Noah's great-grandfather. In fact, Noah had quite a godly heritage. Enoch walked with God, and then he was no more, it says, because God took him. He, he didn't die. There's only two men in the Bible that didn't die. One, well, apart from, well, Jesus did die and rose again. But two men in the Bible that didn't die. One was Enoch. The other one was? Huh? Elijah. Right, Elijah. They, God took both of them. Uh, Enoch was one. The next man was Methuselah. Methuselah lived for 969 years, the oldest man in the Bible. And it's, he died, if you work out the dates, he died the same year that the flood took place. And you can work that out from the times that are in the Bible there. And it is said that the seven days that, that God gave prior to the flood coming upon the world was in, in Jewish uh, uh, testimony is that, that they gave seven days of mourning for Methuselah because he was such a godly man. So he had this godly heritage that he grew up with. And it carried on in the life of Noah. Now you might be here and you might be a man who looks back on your life and you might say, well, I don't have that godly heritage. My father, my grandfather, my great-grandfather, they, they, they didn't grow up as Christians. They didn't grow up in the church. They didn't teach me anything. But you can be the one to start it. It always has to start somewhere. It might as well start with you. It might as well start with me. 
Whether you, your background is so, you know, we're, we're living in an age, I believe, where we like to blame. <laughs> we always like to blame our parents or our circumstances or our situation. And we put the blame somewhere else. It's never here. But it can start right here where we, where we have a, start a godly heritage in our lives and in our families. So he had a godly heritage. But what does it mean to walk with God? Well, I looked it up in the, I know you like your, it's not a Greek, it's Hebrew, because the Old Testament was in Hebrew. I know you like your Hebrew lessons for the day, okay? The word for walk in, uh, that's translated here is the Hebrew word halak. And literally translated, the word halak means to walk. Okay? You got that? That's literally what it means, to walk. So he says, it means literally to walk with God. To walk with him. Wherever you went, wherever Noah went, he was with God. God was with him. He went wherever God wanted him to go, did whatever God wanted him to do. There was nothing, in fact, that he did in his life that God didn't want him to do. That was what his life was geared around, walking with God. That doesn't mean he wasn't perfect. Just read a little further on after chapter 9. And he went and got drunk after the ark and all the rest. And uh, so we... but. But that doesn't mean we're not perfect. It doesn't mean we haven't got problems. It doesn't mean we have difficulties. But we can know that God is with us. That no matter what we do in our lives, that God is there with us. Jesus Christ told us to follow in his steps. It tells us that in, in one of Peter's letters. It says that Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. Walk with Jesus. Whether you're at work, whether you're at church. It's easy when you're in church, isn't it? Everyone else is kind of doing the same thing. They're all singing the same songs. They're all listening to the preacher. They're all doing, reading their Bible, doing all that. It's easy when you're in church, or it's easy to kind of look like you're doing right, walking with God. But what about Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday? Well, that's when we're to walk with God. No matter what we're doing in our life, we're to walk with him, to follow in his steps. It means he stayed close to God. Bible says... The three things that the Bible says God is. Now, God is a lot of things, but three things it says that God is. And all, two of them are found in 1 John, and one of them found is in the Gospel of John. The first one is God is love. God is love. God loves us with all his heart, that he sent his only begotten son. He so much loved us that he sent his only begotten son to die on a cross for each and every one of us. We love because he first loved us. And if we're going to walk with God, then we're going to walk in love. Because if you're going to walk the way God walked, you're going to walk in the same kind of love that God has for each and every one of us. That means you're going to love your wife. I'm going to pick on the guys today. You, women, you can take the reverse of that, but it's, it's Father's Day, okay? It means you're going to love your wife. It means you're going to love your kids. It means you're going to love the people you work with. It means you're going to love your boss. It means you're going to love your neighbor. Even when they do things you don't like them to do. It means you're going to love your enemy. Because that's the way God walked. God is love. And when we walk with God, we walk in love. The second one is this. God is spirit. Is the second one. God is spirit. They might not be in the same order on there. I put the verses down there. They might be in a different order. <laughs> if you're filling it in. But God is spirit. That means if we're going to walk with God, we're going to walk a spiritual walk. Now, again, when you're, when you're, you know, you're sitting down or you're, you're kneeling down and you're praying, you say, well, that's, that's spiritual. Or you pick up your Bible and you, you read your Bible. Well, that's spiritual. But no, you, you, it, it can be spiritual going to work if you're doing it all for the glory. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all for the glory of God. It's, it's spiritual, you know, I, I noticed Tim at the back there, when, when Tim goes and fixes the plumbing at somebody's house, it's a spiritual thing, if we're doing it for the glory of God. When you go and visit with that neighbor of yours, it's a spiritual, we've got to walk as spiritual people, not just fleshly people. And the third one, God is love, God is spirit, the third one that God is, is God is light. God is light. Light is opposite to dark. If you're going to walk in the light, you don't walk in the dark. 
If you're going to walk in love and you're going to be, walk a spiritual walk, you're not going to walk in darkness. You're not going to walk in sin. You're not going to walk in those, in, in those places where you should not go. You cannot be doing, having a spiritual walk with God if you're going to some of the places that some men go to or listening to some of the things that some men listen to or doing some of the things that some men do. If we're going to walk in the light as he is in the light, then we will have fellowship one with another as we have fellowship with God. We have got to walk in light. I love the story of Richard Stearns. Richard Stearns was the president of World Vision, still is the president of World Vision. And uh, just after Haiti had the great earthquake, and some of us, of course, had opportunity to go down and visit Haiti, Richard Stearns was there at the same time, just after that earthquake hit, and he went to a church in one of the tent cities. In fact, the church itself was a tent, and it was not only was it a tent, it was a tent held together by duct tape. The place was packed with people. And the front row of these seats that had been set out were six amputees. The person leading the singing was a lady who herself had gone through a tremendous trauma. She was a single mother. Her name was Demosi Lufan. She was 32 years old, had two children. And when the earthquake hit, a wall had collapsed on her and pinned her underneath. Crushed her arm, her right arm, and crushed her left leg. And four days after the earthquake, she had to have both of them removed. And she was up there at the front of that makeshift church with hundreds of people in there leading the worship for God to God. She said to Richard Stearns, he brought me back like Lazarus, giving me the gift of life. And I think he's given me two things to do. One is to raise my family and the other is to praise him. And Richard Stearns said, I feel pity for them. But it is they who ought to feel pity for me, for the shallowness of my walk with God. How is your walk with God? Is it shallow or is it deep? Do you walk in love? Do you walk in truth? Do you walk in spirit? Are you walking with God? The second one that we see about Noah is that he was committed to God. His commitment. Walking with God requires commitment. It says Noah was a righteous man and blameless among the people of his time. Verse 11 says, Now the earth was corrupt, full of violence. If we go back a few verses to verse 5, chapter 6, verse 5, it says this, The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become. And that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. That's what man had become like. And if we're going to live for God, if we're going to love God, if we're going to serve God in this kind of lifestyle, in, in this kind of generation, a generation that's growing more and more to the point where it doesn't want to serve God, doesn't want to know anything about God. If we're going to live for God and love God and serve God in this generation, we're going to have to be committed to Jesus Christ. We're going to have to be fully committed to him. We're going to have to live by faith. Commitment, uh, the word in, in, in English comes from two Latin words, which mean to join with. And if we're going to join with God, then we can make it through. And we can be the kind of people that God has called us to be. I told you last week a story about a man by the name of Clarence Jordan. I'm going to tell you another story about him. Clarence Jordan started Koinonia Farms. Uh, it was a farm that was for the poor people of his community down in, in Georgia. And it was for poor people. It didn't matter if you were black or white. And he started it, as it says up here, in 1942. When he started in 1942 in the Deep South, mixing black and white, as I mentioned last week, it was, was a no-no. It just, people of the, of the community in which he lived hated it. In fact, you know, Clarence Jordan had two PhDs. He could have been anything that he wanted to be, but he chose to serve the poor. And the people of his community did everything to stop him. 
including the people of his church, sadly. They did everything to stop him. They, they, they cut his water off. They, they, they abused him. They put letters into the papers. They did everything they could to stop him. Eventually, by 1954, after 12 years of this, the Ku Klux Klan could take it no longer, and so they stepped in. The Ku Klux Klan came along, and they burnt down the whole place apart from Clarence Jordan's house, which they riddled with bullets. Every single person in the place had to run apart from one black family who refused to leave. He recognizes the voices of people in that clan from his own church, including a reporter from the newspaper who the very next day came to visit Clarence Jordan to write an article on what had taken place. And he said, well, Mr. Jordan, he said, uh, you know, you got two of them, they're uh, PhDs. And, uh, you know, you've tried to make a success of this farm, but it doesn't seem to have done very well. It seems like everything's gone wrong. What are you going to do now? And Clarence Jordan, who was at the time just hoeing his garden while the man spoke, stopped hoeing and looked at him and said, I don't think you understand. We are not about success. We are about faithfulness. We will be staying. Good day. And they rebuilt the place. And it's still going today. To the glory of God. But it takes commitment. It takes faithfulness. It takes a heart that is fully dedicated and devoted to God. To fulfill the will of God in your life. And the greatest task that we men and you ladies have is to raise your family. To raise your children up in such a way that they will honor God and serve God all the days of their life. And there is nothing that should come in the way of making that happen. The third one, in addition to his relationship in walking with God and being committed to God, is his obedience. He was told to build an ark. The ark was 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and three decks high, 46 feet high. It was about 11, the height of about an 11-story building, and it was as long as about one and a half football fields, if you, if you know anything about football. It was a big boat. Uh, it is estimated that it had about 100,000 square feet of deck space, and it could, could, could hold probably around 71,000 animals. So that's a lot of work. Can you imagine if someone told you to make that thing? <laughs> what you would be thinking? But he was obedient. When he heard to build from God, to build an ark, it says that being warned of things not yet seen, it said in Hebrews 11. No one, no one had seen a flood in those days. No one knew what was going to happen. In fact, he was building this ark, and it was probably built in the middle of a field. And he's building this huge, long, football and a half field long boat, 11 stories high, in the middle of some field. Because he wanted to be obedient to God, even though it didn't make sense. And you think, well, how, how could he be sure that he was hearing from God? Because he had walked with God all his life. He had walked with God. He had learned to hear the voice of God. And that is what we've got to do. We've got to spend time with him. We've got to learn to walk with God and be committed to him. And we will hear from God. We will know when the voice of God is telling us what we should be doing. And so he built the ark. He had learned to trust but obedience is three things I put down there on your sheets if you fill them in. But the first one is this. Obedience is costly. Now think about this for a moment. I don't know what it cost him to build that boat. <laughs> but that's one big boat. I don't know what lumber cost in those days. Probably not quite as expensive as it is today. But in those days it probably was just as, as bad. If not that, he had to cut it down himself. I don't know. But it was costly. To build a boat that size was going to cost him a lot of money. 
it was also going to cost him a lot of time to be obedient to God. It was also going to cost him a lot of his reputation in the community. Just imagine for a moment how his reputation in the community went down. Who is this idiot? He's building a boat in the middle of the field. I mean, what, what's it for? Well, he says it's going to rain. He says it's going to thunder and lightning. He says the, 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 the water is going to come down. It's going to flood this earth. Well, can you imagine his reputation in his community? It cost him a lot of things. And if we are going to serve God, if you are going to raise your family to be a godly family, it is going to cost you something. It is going to cost you a lot of things in your life. It can be money. It can be time. It can be many, many things. Secondly, not only is it costly, being obedient is messy. Now, I don't know about you, but during my time as a dad, I've had rabbits. Well, we, we bought two rabbits. <laughs> we, said to, we said to them at a the store, we said, can you try and make sure that it's like two males or two females? They said, well, we can never be quite sure. Well, within a... Do, do, do you know how quickly? <laughs> we had 24... Be, before, the, the first lot had a litter. Of, we call it a litter? I don't know. We had a bunch, a herd of rabbits. And you meant to separate them then, right? You meant to se- but you know what? Before we'd, you meant to, before we'd had a chance to separate them, they'd done it again. We had 24 rabbits. And then somebody opened the door. Honestly, it wasn't me. But, but a lot of them got out. We had, we've, we've had rabbits. We've had gerbils. Um, what, what else have we had? We, we have had dogs. We've had cats. We've had birds. We've had fish. And, and you know what? They're all smelly. They're all a mess. They're all a pain in the neck to, to look after and, and deal with. And, and imagine 71,000 of them. Woo! Male and female, every one of them, they're in that ark for one year. How many rabbits is that? I don't know. <laughs> but there were a lot of animals in that. It was messy. And being obedient to God is messy. You know what a lot of us would like to do? We, we, sometimes we get this ark mentality. You know, everyone get in the ark, close the door, and keep us safe. I'm not going out. And we get that kind of mentality at times. But a true ark is where real life takes place. And we've got to learn to live with real life. To deal with the messes of life. To deal with the problems. And if we're truly going to walk with God, we can know that he will be with us. And he will give us the strength. He will give us the endurance. He will give us the courage to do what has to be done. To love those people that need to be loved. To forgive those people that need to be forgiven to do the right thing, to live right in all our days, no matter what else is going on around us. And in addition to being costly and being messy, being obedient is unpopular. I'm sorry, it it would be great to think that it was popular and say, well, everyone's going to love you because you're going to follow God. Noah preached righteousness. In 2 Peter it says that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. He preached righteousness for 120 years and not one person listened, apart from his family. Man, can you imagine that? I hope some of you listen sometimes. (laughs) But being obedient to God isn't popular. And if you're truly going to follow God, there's going to be times when you're going to come right up against other people and they won't like it. And then you have to make that choice. But as for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. In addition to his relationship with God and his commitment and his obedience, the last one is courage. Because you can't live like that without courage. It takes great courage to live for God. But Noah was prepared to stand alone. To stand alone. No matter what anyone else said. No matter what anyone else thought. No matter how unpopular it was. No matter how costly it was. No matter how messy it was. He was prepared to stand alone. If no one else believes me, 
I'm going to stand for God. If no one else will listen, I'm going to stand for God. If no one else is going to follow, I'm going to stand for God. And that's the choice that each and every one of us have to make. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. Please stand. I'm going to ask the, the men, if you can just stay down here, we've got a video, a little video to show. You can just stand, get to the front and just wait at the front. The, the band can come up here. Back in 1999, on the 17th of April, sorry, on the 20th of April, Cassie Bernal, who was just 17 years old at the time, like every day of her life, or at least every weekday, Cassie Bernal went to school. The school that she attended was Columbine High School. But on this particular day, the 20th of April, 1999, two men, two young men, had stormed the building, wielding guns. Cassie Bernal had given her life to the Lord not long before, a few years prior. Apparently led to the Lord by her dad. One of those killers, his name was Dylan Klebold, put a gun to her head and said, Do you believe in God? She said, Yes. And he pulled the trigger. A 17-year-old girl had great courage to stand up for her God. No matter what it cost, no matter how messy it was going to be, no matter how difficult, how about us? How about you, especially you men, seeing as this is Father's Day? Some of you have seen the movie Courageous. And there's one man in that movie that is acted by Alex Kendrick. He plays the role of Adam Mitchell. And at the end of that movie, towards the end of that movie, he gives a call to the men. And we're going to show that video clip right now. I now believe that God desires for every father to courageously step up and do whatever it takes to be involved in the lives of his children. But more than just being there, providing for them, he's to walk with them through their young lives and be a visual representation of the character of God, their father in heaven. The father should love his children and seek to win their hearts. He should protect them, discipline them, and teach them about God. He should model how to walk with integrity and treat others with respect and should call out his children to become responsible men and women who live their lives for what matters in eternity. Some men will hear this and mock it or ignore it. But I tell you that as a father, you are accountable to God for the position of influence he has given you. You can't fall asleep at the wheel only to wake up one day and realize that your job or your hobbies have no eternal value but the souls of your children do. Some men will hear this and agree with it, but have no resolve to live it out. Instead, they will live for themselves and waste the opportunity to leave a godly legacy for the next generation. But there are some men who regardless of the mistakes we've made in the past, regardless of what our fathers did not do for us, We'll give the strength of our arms and the rest of our days to loving God with all that we are and to teach our children to do the same. And whenever possible, to love and mentor others who have no father in their lives, but who desperately need help and direction. And we are inviting any man whose heart is willing and courageous to join us in this resolution. 
In my home, the decision has already been made. You don't have to ask who will guide my family, because by God's grace, I will. You don't have to ask who will teach my son to follow Christ, because I will. Who will accept the responsibility of providing and protecting my family? I will. Who will ask God to break the chain of destructive patterns in my family's history? I will. Who will pray for and bless my children to boldly pursue whatever God calls them to do? I am their father. I will. I accept this responsibility and it is my privilege to embrace it. I want the favor of God and his blessing on my home. Any good man does. So where are you men of courage? Where are you fathers who fear the Lord? It's time to rise up and answer the call that God has given to you and to say, I will, I will, I will. Amen. I'm going to ask the men to come up here. And as we sing on this final song, I'm going to ask you men, if you want to say, I will, I'm going to ask you to come out and come to, this, come to the front here where we can just say a prayer for you. That we might ask the Spirit of God to come down upon us to give us that strength to be the man that he has called us to be. you've made so many mistakes in the past that, that you don't know if you can live for God. 
Maybe you look at your life and the way it's going right now and the struggles that you have, even just opening the Bible or coming to church, you don't know if you can stand up for God. But God knows where you are at. God knows your heart. God knows what situation you're in. But God also knows what you can become. And so, Lord, I pray that you'll speak to each and every one of our hearts today. And for all those men who may be thinking to themselves, I don't know if I can do this, give them that strength to say, no, but I know what I can be. And that's what I want to be. And so as we sing on this song, we're just going to close it off, just finish up one more time. We're just going to close that song off. Just, I encourage you to come forward, and we're just going to have a close word of prayer, and then we're going to leave. in power that we might have the courage to live for you that we might have the boldness to stand for you no matter what it costs no matter how messy it might get no matter how unpopular it might seem amongst those that we are with today we choose to follow you give us that courage Lord to be men of God I pray for each and every person in this place that, Lord, you know our hearts, you know our desires, you know what we want in life, Lord, but most of all, you know what we can become. And so, Lord, I pray that you will touch each and every person in this place, that we'll walk out of this place having known that we've been in the presence of God and that I want to walk in that presence all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless you all. Before you all leave... We have some Mr. Bigs to give out, so we've got to give, because these, so we'll get, uh,